Aloha and welcome to Security Matters. I am your host, Keisha King, and today we're going to have a really good conversation about security in our schools and other important places. As you know, we had several mass shootings, um, the most recent in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where a disgruntled employee went in after resigning and shot and killed several of his colleagues. We're going to talk about now Safe Defend, a company who is able to help us in reducing the amount of casualties and protect ourselves by getting information to police officers faster. Joining us today, Safe Defend and our friend Doug. Welcome to Safety Security Matters, Doug. Thank you for having us, Keith. Having me, Keisha. It really is um, an exciting. Uh, um, opportunity and I appreciate you letting us come on today. It's totally my pleasure. I believe in solutions and being solution oriented. And so while we have had much discussion about mass shootings in our schools and other places of business, I'd love to be um, more about the results and try and find ways that we can prevent the number of casualties. And it seems as if Safe Defend can help us do that. Before we start talking about them, why don't you tell us about your background? Well, um, Keisha, I was a, a police officer for 20 years. I retired as a captain. I ran um, one of the police academies here in the Midwest um, for uh, three and a half years. I've trained over 15,000 civilians on how to respond to active shooter situations, and I've trained about 700 police officers on what to do if, in a situation. Um, what was interesting is Safe Defend was a company that was actually founded by a, a, form, a friend of mine. Uh, he was a principal at um, an elementary school. And after Sandy Hook in 2012, he started looking at the way we respond to these. And he realized that the, the two biggest aspects were that law enforcement wasn't getting notified in time and we weren't getting our lockdowns done quickly enough. And so he looked at sort of, you know, the principles of how do we do that quicker? And obviously alarm systems is one of the ways it's gonna work. And so he developed an alarm system that can be placed in schools that will notify teachers and staff, notify building occupants and notify police where they're needed within that building. I love it. In a nutshell, faster response is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. And that's so, so necessary. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that I look at is I have actually, un unfortunately, I had an opportunity when I was in law enforcement, I was a police sergeant, and I did respond on a an active shooter situation. And by the time we got there, it was in a manufacturing plant. It was a terminated employee that walked out to his car and came back in with a gun. By the time we got there, and we did our darndest to get there as quickly as we could, um, it was about five minutes our response time. The, the perpetrator was gone. Fortunately, nobody was uh, injured in that incident. He did shoot 18 rounds before leaving. but we that was one of those situations where somebody actually actually had to pick up and dial 911 what was interesting is that if there was ever a fire in that building they wouldn't have to do that all they'd have to do is just pull a pull an alarm and immediately fire would know where they're needed and would respond what's interesting is i don't understand in schools why we still think that 911 is the best plan or to try and use two-way radios and things like that we need to just have our teachers activate an alarm put that building on lockdown and know that police are responding it's interesting that you say active and alarmed and um, that they need to go into lockdown. We have a lot of lockdown drills as it is, and yet there still isn't enough information about where the incident is happening. We just know that we need to get protection um, or go into the safe corner in our classroom. So we're not fully aware of what's happening and where we just, we have codes that we have to follow. Can you talk to me for a little bit about how Safe Defend works and how the response time would be quicker for everyone involved? So what, what we do at Safe Defend is we use a, a just very simple technology. We use um, text messaging, we use emails to make sure that we alert staff, alert law enforcement. Most 911 centers have text to 911. And so we're able to just piggyback right on that and send a text message right to dispatch. What would happen is that in, in the event of a crisis, all we need a teacher to do is to just reach up and they would have each of these boxes in the classroom. We would have things like this device here in the hallways, and then we have siren strobes. Can what you the demonstrate strobe... how that works yes. for us? Certainly, and so in a crisis, all we need the teacher to do is to just put their finger on that box, and then they've activated the system. 
oh, wow. system would go off. And it, what it's doing is, is it would text an email alert, the text here, to from text and email alerts are going out. And what it's providing them is information specific down to like the classroom, the, the address of the building, the classroom, hallway information, if you have blue or color coded hallways, things like that. And then inside the box, we have stuff for teachers to assist them, um, help mitigate casualties with trauma response, um, help them protect the classroom if the perpetrator was trying to break through the door, things like that. But the most important thing is that law enforcement is notified within seconds where they need to be specifically within that building. And that's the thing that's gonna save lives when we start talking about what's happened in past incidents. Right, so now once a teacher puts their fingerprint on the Safe Defend box, tons of information is released. But how does the machine know where the incident is happening? It's based upon what information? Because a fingerprint, so, yeah, please explain. Each of the boxes is coded to the classroom itself. So if this was classroom 201, it would give the name of the high school, the address of the high school, any hallway information, say, you know, southeast hallway or southeast corner of the building, and then it would say room 201. Now, mm -hmm. the important thing, for, important thing for that is that law enforcement, once they come in, they know specifically where to go. And a lot of dispatch centers have copies of maps, so they'll be able to direct the officers to where, say, the cafeteria is, where the, you know, um, the shop is or the art classroom, things like that. So dispatch can pull up maps within their center and tell the officers where to go within the building. But more importantly is the teachers and staff, they know exactly where they are in relation to that threat. So if they're on the entire opposite side of a campus or if they're in another building, then they can change the way they respond. If I'm, on, if I'm in the same hallway as that threat, I know that I'm just going to go on the lockdown. I'm not going to leave my classroom. I'm getting my kids into the safer corner, turning my lights off, blocking the window, and I'm, and I'm going to protect the classroom and the threshold. But if I'm on the other side of that building, maybe I take my kids to the exits and we head out and we start moving away from the building itself. And so that we're moving away from the threat. So it provides a lot of information immediately. Okay. That indeed it does. So now this machine is able to contact dispatch for 911 and then and, and and we can also directly link we have um so our system is installed in about 12 different states we have over 150 schools that we're in, involved in um and we coordinate with their sros or their local police chiefs or the police departments and a lot of you know supervisors or commanders they have department issued phones so we just take their text phone number and we can send that text directly to them they can then just start directing their officers where they need to go down to the room number you're needed in room 212. And that's what we're starting needing to do is to cut through all the layers of information of the confusion of two-way traffic radio, people calling up to the front office trying to figure out what's going on because everybody starts calling in 911 and they say we've got a problem at the high school. But, you know, like at Parkland, that was a 45-acre campus. People didn't know where on the campus to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I want to talk about that a little bit more with, with what happened at Parkland. But I want to get a little bit of clarity because what you're saying is this machine is going to let the police know immediately where we are or where the incident is happening based upon the fact that a teacher's fingerprint goes on the machine first and it identifies the room, etc. Um, however, how will they know that there's an active shooter? Is there a separate code for active shooters? Or is there something like a, a, spe a special code or something to distinguish between a fire alarm versus an active shooter or a bomb threat or tsunami threat? How will we know what type of emergency that we are faced with? So on the on, um our system is designed only to deal with hostile intruders, so we don't address any of the other threats. There's already fire regulation codes, and then there's standards for things like tsunamis um, and hurricanes. And so those alarms are separate, and then the responses are separate. So our system is exclusive for the hostile intruder, um, but in the actual text, it'll say active shooter um, lockdown. And what that what was so important is that we understand that the training comes in where we tell the teachers, this is for the type of situation where you have an armed 
perpetr a perpetrator who's armed in the building or somebody that's actively hostile towards students and staff and that we need to get the building on lockdown immediately. So the moment that this is activated, you're going to get what we call a global response. And what I mean by that is you're going to get every law enforcement agency from counties and local police and government entities and security guards that are in that area um, that are going to start responding. And so when this goes off, this is because there is an armed student or an armed um, perpetrator adult in that building and tend to harm the students in there. So it's only used for that specific purpose. Okay, I got it. So this is specific to that, which is very necessary, and I'm grateful that it is. But this sounds like an entirely different type of training that teachers will have to go through. Who provides this training? Who's responsible for that? Well, it is one of the trainings that we do, but it's really not different than anything like the Run, Hide, Fight or Alice or some of these other trainings. In a lot of these situations, uh, what the number one thing we need to know is we need to know that the building needs to be on lockdown and that you need to clear the hallways. And so that's why we have the siren strobes that go off in the hallways so students know to find the closest classroom, you know, not try and get back to their science class or math class, but to get mm -hmm. into the closest room. And so what we're doing is, is we're providing information. Number one is there's a threat in the building. So seek shelter or safety. And then the next thing we're doing is following it up with a text message that then tells them where the threat is so that the teacher and staff can make a decision. Do I stay barricaded or do I attempt to run based on what's going on. And then the, the last thing we do is that we have them a way that they can counter the threat, that if someone, you know, provide them with tools like a tactical flashlight and other objects that they can use to prevent people from getting into the classroom if it happened where the, the, the perpetrator was trying to get into a specific classroom. Okay. That's what happened at Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. So who has access to this text message? Is it teachers only? Will students have access? What about their parents? All right, so we definitely won't do parents, and I, I know that a lot of parents would love to know this. The last thing we need right here is uh, 800 parents flocking to the school before law enforcement gets there. So it's going to be staff and student, or sorry, staff and um, faculty, all the adults in the building, and then law enforcement is going to get those texts, and dispatch will get those texts. Same thing with the emails um, that, that follows up with the same type of information. It'll be provided to those people. So that's that first tier of information. The other thing that we do is we also will broadcast this out to say these principals. So if it happened at the high school, we also also send texts and emails out to the staff, the administrative staff at the other schools, because they need to go on lockdown. If you have a threat at your high school, every emergency service in the community is going to be headed to that school. There's nobody to protect the other schools. And we've seen situations right. where students have talked about creating diversions. So mm -hmm. if something's happened at one of your high school, every school in the community goes like locked down because of the, the um the, the potential that all the resources are being used up. And so that's the type of stuff for that. So it's a predetermined list. These are the people we're putting on that list, law enforcement, whomever, they get on that list. The school makes that determination who they want on the list. And then they would just get that information in, the, in, the, in a threat. All right. So it's almost time for us to take a break, but I want to make this point that the teachers then have a little bit more power because they'll be able to determine that an incident is taking place on the opposite side of campus, for example, and they get to determine where they go. For example, they can run out away from harm's way. With that power, though, also comes another aspect of responsibility that I want to talk to you about when we come back. Um, because I'm thinking about, or I, I, I'm also hearing you say teachers as medics, they will have a responsibility um, to help um, in a medical way. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about Mr. Peterson, who got into a little bit of trouble while making a decision for himself in an incident that happened during a um, shooting at a school. So you are watching Security Matters. I am your host, Keisha King, and we'll be right back after this break. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Aloha, I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. 
We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Aloha and welcome back to Security Matters. I am your host, Keisha King, and right now we are speaking with Doug from uh, Safe Defend, and we are speaking with him about protecting our youth while they are in school if, in fact, they are faced with an active shooter. Safe Defend will help with a quicker response time from medical and police personnel who can get there and come to the rescue as we so desire for them to do. Welcome back, Doug. Thanks for having me back, Keisha. Indeed. So the last thing we touched on was teachers as medics. Now, I say that tongue in cheek because you all actually provide some basic training and tools for teachers to stop the bleed. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? Sure. One of the things I wanted to touch on right before break, you did say it, it does empower teachers. And, and it really does, because within the classroom, all the teacher has to do is put their finger down on the box, and that's what activates the system. But then they can get into that safer corner. Then they can start to work on the, the light. So it takes one second to make sure that everybody in the building knows that there's a threat and that law enforcement's en route. It's the same principle with the fire alarm. All I have to do is pull down the fire alarm, and I know fire department's en route, and I know everybody in the building knows that there's a threat. That's what we've done is just taken that. The reason we use the fingerprint is for the security of it, to prevent um, accidental or malicious discharges. If a student puts their finger down on there, it's not going to do anything. It, it won't go off. It'll actually read the fact we get a notification that there's what we call a, a failure to read, meaning it'll indicate to us that someone was trying to um, uh, we call them curiosity touches. And that's just when the students are like, what would happen if I put my finger on there? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the trauma, this is part of the whole federal Stop the Bleed program. The Department of Homeland Security has come up with this program. We've been doing this for about five years. The DHS program, I think, came out at the end of 2017. But it's just saying that in a crisis situation, we are overloading EMS um, resources because they can't get enough ambulances there to deal with say five or ten casualties immediately eventually they will but in the in the the worst case scenario you've got um, casualties that are losing blood and that hemorrhaging is what's going to kill them and so there's basic stuff that can be done just with pressure points with things like tourniquets and then with some hemostatic agents or gauze pads that can be applied just to slow that down it's right. it it all all of this borders on the, the uh, combat life support, which came out of the military um, and, and what they real, realized for um, battlefield um, dressings and how the first person there just needed to um, take the first aid kit, bandage a guy up and keep moving. And then the medic would come up behind. But it, it bought enough time that it was actually called life extending measures. Right. And we know in those scenarios, in the heat of the moment, all of those seconds matter, and that's what we want to do. We want to get in there, and we want to save a life. We don't want to lose anyone. Certainly, teachers do not want to lose a student. And I think that with the proper training, they can save a life. However, I think there is also that risk that what if they did all they can and they lose a life? I think that is something that probably every teacher uh, would dread the thought of. So that is something that still needs to be considered. And I think that the, the main point is to not have an active shooter on campus in the first place so that we wouldn't have to be faced with that responsibility or challenge. Uh, but moving on, I like the idea of everything that you've said thus far. Um, tell us about where Safe Defend is now and how it's working there. So we, um, we like to say we have 100% deterrence because in all the schools we put it into, we haven't had any incidents. Um, the biggest thing is that the parents feel a lot better. Um, it, it, it is interesting that it's a different time. You're, you're talking about your experience with your teachers and your students, and I'm sorry, even your children. They kind of grew up in an age where doing a safety or a crisis drill isn't that, isn't that traumatizing. But the parents actually are the ones that really worry about this sort of stuff. But the students handle it. So we just have to understand that this is where we're at and that by doing these drills and practicing how to get into the safer corner, we can do enough. Um, where we're at, we, I, we have actually several, um, so we are in government buildings. So similar to what had, they had in Virginia Beach, we have 
have um, city halls that have our system in. We have manufacturing plants. We have nursing facilities, hospitals. We have um, uh, business offices that do this. Under um, OSHA, there's a general duty to warn clause. So um, there is actually a requirement that employers be able to notify um, their employees of a recognized hazard and workplace violence is one of the ones that most employee employers miss out on and it actually ends up being having quite a lot of liability if you run a business and there's a threat inside your business and you have no way of notifying your employees to seek cover or shelter you could be held liable um, and Which those is, are the types of things you know i don't uh, sorry to cut you off but you know that is a huge challenge especially for small business owners because you cannot think of all the different ways to really find or to communicate with your employees uh, that there is a safety hazard. Right. And, and I, the biggest thing, though, is that if there was a fire or a chemical spill or a weather related emergency, most of us have these procedures in place that this is what we're going to do. And this, this is where we'll go. This is where we'll seek shelter. This is where our, our uh, rally point will be if there's a fire and we have to evacuate the building. A lot of buildings, just even the smallest five to ten person in um, business has that, but they ignore the, the workplace violence stuff. And that's what they need to do is to develop these sort of uh, procedures um, to just maybe take one room and say, all right, this is the room where we would barricade in. This is how we lock the door from the inside. But if you're going to be in an internal room, you need to make sure that either there's a phone in there or that your cell phone works. So walk into that um, supply room and make sure you can call 911 from in there and use that as your safety room. Just basic things like that will actually help employers. That's true. That's true. It's so sad that we now have to have several discussions about workplace violence and the repercussions that we face if we have a plan in place or if we don't could be fatal. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about Mr. Peterson, who has found himself in a little bit of trouble because of his actions during an active shooter situation in a school. Can you talk to us about that and your thoughts? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed from the law enforcement perspective of the actions of um, Officer Peterson. I want to say that outright, um, knowing that he stood in that same place for about 40 minutes, I think, according to the video, is just devastating to think that he had an, an, an opportunity to save some of those lives. Um, what's interesting is on the number of charges that he had is that by the time he got there, there were already 24 people that had been shot, which is actually kind of devastating to think how quickly was he was there in under two minutes. He didn't go in but he didn't really have the ability to impact those first 24 lives because that's how how quickly the ambush happened. He's really being um, uh, tasked with the idea that he did, if he had taken action, he could have made a very big difference on the third floor. Um, in order to understand a little bit, let me run through what happened in Parkland. There was a lot of failures because they focused on perimeter security. Again, about 88% of school shooters, um, even in and workplace shooters even higher, they're intimate with the building. They're either domestic partners, they're ex disgruntled employees, or in the case of schools, 88% of them are students. So they're already inside the building. That's what we saw in like the Colorado shooting really very early, is the security guard was protecting the perimeter and the students just walked right past them with guns hidden and, and did the, the damage. But what was interesting is that um, the shooter in Parkland uh, shot the 24 people, but he went up to the second floor. I'm sorry, when he was shooting people on the first floor, the dust and the gunpowder set off the fire alarm. So the people on the third floor couldn't hear the gunfire. So they heard the fire alarm and they came out in the hallways. But the people on the second floor, they heard the gunfire first, then the fire alarm went off. They knew not to evacuate. So when the perpetrator went up to the second floor, he was actually, he could be seen looking into windows, but all the teachers have their students over in the safer corners with their lights out and the windows blocked. And nobody got injured on that second floor because it was successful. He then, the shooter got up to the third floor and did his damage. And that's what, that's where Peterson had the opportunity to intervene. Mm -hmm. The bigger thing, though, is there was a lawsuit um, from a bunch of the parents in uh, that got dismissed in 2018, and the federal judge ruled that the under the 14th Amendment that the there was you know as much as you want to say it, but police and staff had no duty to actually protect those students, um, mm -hmm. which is very interesting to see how this is going to go from a civil camp stand standpoint. It was dismissed but now they're gonna charge him criminally. So I'm sure they know what they're doing. I think it does send the right message, and that is if you are tasked with protecting those students, you are part of that layer of security, you can't really opt out, and, and the, 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 the results can be catastrophic if you do. Right, you know, and I think, isn't that their motto? Uh, protect and defend and safety. And... Protect and serve. <laughs> protect and serve is the LA Protect model. and serve, and, and yet they failed in that particular case and had the opportunity to make a difference and didn't. So tough case for everyone involved. Um, tough 
decision that he had to face. Um, and I, I, I'm happy not to be in his shoes, but I'm hoping that they all know what they're doing and that justice will be served appropriately for all matters. It's tough, very, very tough. I have a question wanna, though. Go ahead. Uh, well, the one thing that you want to cover is the number one thing that I, I tell teachers all the time, and this comes down to every business, is to, is to be able to have a door that locks. The Department mm -hmm. of Education recommends that if students are in the classroom, the door should be locked. Because if that door is locked, all I have to do is get my kids into that safer corner. Um, that's that's so important. You also need to understand how to use your PA system. At Parkland, they had this four-digit code they had to type in, but it didn't work in the hallways. It had all this. So if, you're, if your PA system is being used to put the building on lockdown, understand that you need to have speakers in hallways because it might happen in transition time. But teachers need to understand, I need to know what, how do I use you know, how do I call the front office? Where is that sort of thing? All that. Mm -hmm. They have to think those things ahead of time because in a crisis, they're not going to do it. The number one thing they need to do is keep that door locked, though. Keep the door locked. You know, you bring up another point, though, that I wanted to kind of touch on is the volume. You mentioned that uh, in the case at Peterson or Parkland, that they couldn't hear the gunshots over the fire alarm. So is safe to fend loud enough to get louder than the actual gunshots or yes, the yeah, fire yeah, alarm or what have you? Right. So the safe defense system, we've, we really thought through a lot of things. One of the things that our system does is, is, is it goes off for two minutes and then it goes silent. And we do that on purpose because two minutes is about enough time that any teacher that might be in band or gym class or have a movie going on, they're going to hear the fire alarm. The students are going to hear it. But then we let it go silent because everybody already at this point knows that there's a threat. Law enforcement's in route. But we want police, when they show up, to, to not to be able to listen to gunfire. We want teachers to be able to hear threats of violence in the hallways, getting closer or coming you know farther away. We want to hear direction from law enforcement. We want teachers to be able to use their cell phones in the classroom. So our system actually does go silent. That doesn't mean the threat's over. But yes, it would it can be heard over a fire alarm it's about this um depending on where it's at but the, the most important thing that we tell people if the, if the active shooter alarm goes off and then the fire alarm goes off without sort of heat and smoke and fire you might consider what your options are because fire alarms have been used unfortunately to draw students out of classrooms in the past and, it, mm -hmm. and so it's one of the things that absent the other indicators of a fire maybe you don't evacuate so quickly if you think there's a threat in the building right and so and it appears as though safe defend also has lights on it which will help if it goes silent i suppose correct right you're right the lights yeah. will, the lights will still keep flashing and, and and that sort of stuff so what we what we've understood at safe defend is where we're failing is that we're focusing so much on access control we're focusing on external su security surveillance cameras uh, two-way radios and all these things that we've been using I was involved in, when I was in junior high, my my school district had a shooting, and the response back in 1983 was to put school resource officers, two-way radios, cameras, and lock the doors. And after mm -hmm. Parkland, we're recommending the same thing. And so at some point, we have to say, wait a second, why isn't this working? You know, the response to a fire is never to say, let's put a fireman and walk through the hallways with a fire extinguisher and hope that he can put it out in time. Um, we need to start doing empowering teachers to say, what do we need to do? We need police to the exact location as quickly as possible. Safe Defend does that. We need the system on lockdown, immediate, or sorry, the school on lockdown. Our Safe Defend system does that. And we need teachers to be able to respond in the classroom if they have an injured student that is bleeding and law enforcement can't get to them in time. We need them to be able to help that student um, extend their life long enough for, for emergency services to get to them. All of those things Safe Defend does. With Thank you so here. much. You know, I love the sound of empowering our teachers with actual res, um, solutions. And it sounds like Safe Defend is a viable solution that we can use to help save lives in the event of an active shooter. We've been speaking today with Doug Parisi right here on Security Matters. I've been your host, Keisha King. Doug, thank you and thanks Safe to Defend. And thank you for watching Security Matters. We'll see you next time. Aloha.